questions, please interrupt me any time you want. I prefer to take questions at once. So then I decided uh, I should rewrite the Haskell compiler in Haskell, so I started doing that. It, for some reason, I never finished, I'm not quite sure what happened. Uh, but it was used uh, at MIT for their PH, Parallel Haskell Compiler. PH is interesting. It's not using lazy evaluation. So if you look at the Haskell standard, it says very carefully a non-strict functional language. It didn't say that from the beginning, it said lazy. But Arvin, who was at MIT, he still is, he objected to this and said it shouldn't say lazy, it should say non-strict, because he had exactly this kind of implementation in mind. So, What's the difference? Well, PH has fine-grained parallelism, so it can easily start up lots of computations in parallel. So it doesn't wait until the very last moment to compute something. It can easily compute something ahead of time in a different thread. And the main thread continues. And if you have a good scheduler, if you started something that you didn't really need, you'll find out sooner or later you can kill off that thread. So it's a very different way of uh, evaluating Haskell. But it gives you the same semantics if you have a good scheduler. It also had uh, strange things like M bars and I bars that are and later appeared in, in GHC as well. Unfortunately, it had them just about the time when uh, monads were introduced, but we didn't quite understand monads. At least I didn't. I'm sure Phil did. But, uh, so, PH did not introduce them in a monadic way, so they were very messy to use. So that came about around about 1995, uh, some years later before you actually came my real program. And I did from that stuff, and John Mason and MIT did all the clever backhand things, and threads and all that stuff, and some other people as well. Um, if you want to know more about PH, you can uh, either talk to me or anything. There he is, yes, or by his book. So then, a few years later, uh, so Blue Spec is a hardware description language. So it looks like Haskell, and you can actually use full Haskell, but it's only available at compile time. So anything you write, will be executed while you're compiling, not when the, the actual hardware is running. So it's a kind of a strange programming model. Definitely two levels. On the first level, you can do anything you like. You have to be careful. This first level that does anything you like can't loop forever or anything like that, because if it loops forever, it means the compiler won't terminate. So you'd better only write terminating stuff on the first level. And the second level, the one that actually executes on the hardware, it has a completely different programming model. So I think BlueSpec is the, uh, the best uh, hardware design language out there. And it's still around. And uh, if you want to know more, you should talk to Nikhil or buy his book. <laughs> Well, 
say that if you get it now to use to design some piece of hardware, people in this room might be disappointed because it no longer looks like Haskell like it did in the beginning. When this was spun out as its own company, the uh, the people who want who were investing all the venture capitalists, they did some due diligence and they found out. So it looks like very long. But underneath there somewhere is still the old stuff from I don't really hear a lot of all, but then the impression that at least parts of it look a bit like Haskell. This is completely wrong. Basically, yes. Basically, completely wrong. Yes. How is that? I mean it has totals. <laughs> <laughs>
should really be called I, because it's the <laughs> one that it's the one that don't you can't fire the missiles in the I monad. You can only read things from the world. <laughs> <laughs> so it's slightly more benign. So it's it's actually there because we, uh, so one of the early uses of this was to interface to Excel. And imagine Excel has a more expressive effect system than Haskell. In Excel, you distinguish between pure computations, computations that have read effects, and computations that can have write effects. So the pure ones are the normal ones. Then you can mark a function to be volatile, which means every time you evaluate it, you might get the different results. And then there are the ones that can have write effects, and those you're simply not allowed to use in, a, in, in the sheet part of an Excel. You can call them from Visual Basic, but you can't use them from the sheet. <coughs> so isn't that embarrassing that Excel has more than that? So an example is the get args function that gets the command line argument. So this is in safe IO rather than IO. And of course you can trivially get anything in safe IO into IO. <coughs> Is there, a, is there a connection between the fact that it's strict and the fact that you have no recursion? No, I don't think so. Well, I'm wondering. Oh, well, there may maybe there is, but I don't know what the connection is. Do you have something in mind? Well, I, I, um, I think the big difference between strict languages and lazy languages is the styles of programs that get written when you sort of compose lots of loop-like things together. I have a little bit about mm -hmm. that, yeah, so, but, yeah. I and if you're not writing loop-like things, then, then maybe it's not a big difference. Um, yeah, so it's the last point, so the, what looks like lists are actually arrays, whatever arrays are, I mean, they have slightly different different cost models, you can access any element in constant time. On the other hand, concatenation and these kind of things might not, well, consing I should say, you might think is constant time, but it's not. And you can pattern You can pattern match on them if you want to. But you, so since, since, since there's no recursion, people typically don't build lists by consing things together. You have to operate on them in bulk, so it doesn't really matter that they are somewhat different in their, in their cost. So it's the more like some vectors than that. So um, so mu is sort of compatible upwards or downwards, whatever, some, some sideways with Haskell. So you have mu code, you can run it as a Haskell program by importing a suitable library. But not the other way around. So Haskell code doesn't automatically work in mu. <coughs> evaluation might come and bite you. Um, so I must say I've taken some freedoms in the in the new compiler. So I like uh, both strict and lazy. Different transformations are valid in strict languages and in lazy languages. So the compiler just assumes that it's all terminating and it can do whatever transformations it likes. So if some of them are only valid in lazy languages, some of them are only valid in strict languages. <coughs> ah, I do them anyway. <laughs> Remember the name of the talk, Pragmatic Haskell. <coughs> so if someone, someone mathematically inclined wonders, I tell them, this is not <coughs> true, but I tell them anyway. Uh, <laughs> so if S is the semantics of strict languages and L is the semantics of lazy languages, then the new semantics is somewhere in between. <laughs> and, and it moves around. It. And it moves around. It. <laughs> and if you have written programs that rely on being on the end of things, uh, that is your fault. So, so did you do this because it was convenient or because it was a... This was convenient, yes. Just, I mean, there is, <coughs> there is this uh, old quote from Shapiro, I don't know which Shapiro, that uh, it's not, 
it's much easier to do compiler transformation or program transformation if you don't have to preserve semantics. <laughs> And 
then uh, all the interop between languages uses, I mean, has some poly conventions that they all agree on, which is uh, C, C poly conventions, yeah. So when GNC gets its cloud computing facilities, which are, is it that it has to go back to that? It, it might happen, uh, but banks are seem to be lots about uh, not invented here in Sinter. I mean, they prefer, at least the two I work in, they prefer to have uh, done things themselves. This is one thing that confuses me. Okay. And this isn't everything in fact, everything can do everything, and everything can serialize everything. Yeah. And then you said, Haskell doesn't do what we need, he can't serialize things. But you had Haskell in the system. So I don't understand how the contradiction is resolved. So, um, the things that, so you, you assume that the, uh, if you have some machine A and some machine B that you need to communicate between, that you have roughly the same, some fixed code base on a lot of these are sort of the core of the stuff. And then people write little things on top of that. The little things on top of that are written in new. And those we can trust are the same on all these machines. <coughs> those bits have to be transported. The ones below, say, the Monte Carlo or solver or something like that, that is, is the same on both sides. And there you can have pieces written in Haskell because it's just it's just a DLL with a bunch of entry points. You know you have a number of functions and they will be the same on both sides. So we don't have to transport those across. Okay, so the only things that transport have to be written in mu, not C plus or Haskell. That's right. So what happens in mu if you send down a, I don't know, send to another machine by this mobility mechanism? Uh, a Haskell function can charge towards the first class family. Then you're probably out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> and what particular kind of out of luck? As in, you lose two million dollars or no, you get the wrong time error, but that causes you two million dollars or right. not. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's like taking the head of the empty list, it also is a catastrophic failure. So so some of we, we do allow you to serialize and unserialize some Haskell data structures that we use. <coughs> but then you have to write some weird Haskell code to do the serialize and unserialize. Okay. So now you might wonder this value, so this compiled the module here and we got the result. What's that? 
all serious Excel users do, we invent some way of encoding some other thing. So when you see one of these, it means it's some complicated value that Excel doesn't know what it is. So we actually use strings for these curly braces and some number in between. Different banks use different methods for encoding these. So I think strings with some markers are fairly sensible. Uh, at Credit Suisse, we used numbers that started at minus 60,000 and counted down, which I think is insane because you can easily confuse those into some computation somewhere. Uh, at Deutsche Bank, they take the pointer and convert it to double and store that in the machine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, what about? Uh, I mean, this is a compiler. What does it compile to? So normally, it compiles some intermediate code that is interpreted, but that's not always fast enough. So we allow people to uh, do compilation to native code. But that's very much on the user control. So the user has to say, I want to compile this thing to native code. This thing can be anything. It's, so there is this function called the compile of type alpha to alpha. And you give it something, and you get something back that does the same thing, hopefully faster. If you give it five, it's kind of uninteresting because five is about as fast as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> but if you give it a function, it will take that function and it will turn it into machine code. It does this by generating LLVM code and then using the LLVM jitter. So, for instance, if I do this, so the two functions, FCN and CFCN, they do the same thing. <coughs> But the first one will be, well, there's a function here, I see. Uh, FCN should have an argument x, I'm sorry. Uh, imagine that it says x there. So then these two would do the same thing, but the second, second one would do it quicker. If you compile CFCF. You can, but nothing interesting happens. You get the same thing back again. Or if you try to give it some C++ function to compile, also you get the same thing back. You get a warning message in this monitor saying, I couldn't actually compile this thing, so I'm giving the same thing back to you. If you compile a compile function applied, partially applied, say, or some term that calls you compile function. Oh. Let's say compile function partially applied, so compile FCN applies to 6, if FCN had 2 of Yes. Also works for compiling partial applications. So you have a function of two arguments, and you give it one argument, and then you say compile on that. That will actually do some partial evaluation. It will take the function and the first argument and munch it into the, the function, and then it will compile the resulting thing. So by compiling partial applications, you can really speed things up compared to compiling the function and then partially apply it. So this, you can do some really cool stuff. So you write your pretty general algorithm that has a bunch of arguments, and then you give it some arguments, and you say compile on that, and you will wire a lot of constants into your compiled code. It will, it will, it will eliminate branches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any of those kind of things. Is it easy for the programmer to understand? When it will and when it won't. <coughs> um, probably not. <laughs> so, I mean, people just see this as some kind of hammer. This is running too slowly. Let me see what happens if I say compile. Bang! Yeah, that's a bit better. <laughs> no, so, I mean, but where, where performance really matters, uh, I mean, they can talk to who will understand that what happens and we can help them tune a little bit where we put these things. I'm guessing that if you want to partially evaluate, that would be perfectly even interpreted for the right moment. That if you take this thing, the pilot, partially apply it, read the pilot, that does no good. If you take this thing, apply it, and then compile it. I lost you somewhere in the middle. So, so it, it, for all functions, it keeps all of the uh, the intermediate representation around. So that's all. Oh, I see. So, so, you, so you, can, you can do this at any stage. So you, this, this is needed for other reasons. Oops, no, I don't have it. So what happens if you try to uh, transport one of these functions or save them down to disk or something that will shift them from your x86 platform to your power PC? Well, then it only shifts over the intermediate representation, and when it, this is part of serialization, and when it's deserialized at the other end, you co-generate at the other end for it. So you'll get your machine code at the other end as well. Function. 
I define this function in Excel. Let's just do a. It's called fun compiled in Excel. Yeah, you got something. It's pretty boring. Uh, I mean, we are all, I hope, slightly interested in compiler technology. And those of you who are, just close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to add a debug flag here. Two hmm. X plus one. Which is 
register has to punch that test if any element of the list has a certain property. And you want it to stop when it's found an element that has that property. It has to be provided. Yeah, I'm at P and then I do more of those. And it will automatically stop at the right point. You write that in a strict language, it will compute all of it. So you, you, laziness has a good things uh, as well. So I would claim laziness is a much nicer way of programming, except for these pesky resources. <coughs> so you definitely need some lazy functions. I mean, even C has lazy functions, like by right, fall, not like that, so you see, but C, but not. and error, that will not call error in C. So in mu, you can say by name, which means use call by name for this function, which basically means use macro expansion for this function. I mean, it's not the bad kind of macro expansion. No weird name captures. So if you write something, if, if i is less than the length of l and l of i, you, you get it's the same as you've written this. So sometimes we, we really need these functions. It, 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 you must have them. So you can do what C, C++, standard ML, camel, I think of camel, at least does. You can say, who these are special, they're wired in. Only us who made the compiler can make these. You can't make them. I don't like that. So in you, you can say this. But by the way, if you never try, if you want to design a language, never use call by name as your calling convention. So here is, that's the definition of function composition in Haskell. Here is the definition in view. I want dot to be all my name. It looks weird. It looks weird. What's this F prime, G prime? Well, also consider this really slow A composed with G. Now, if you were just to take the definition up there and expand those in there, you would move really slow inside the lambda. Don't do that. And this doesn't do that. It has it in the lambda outside there, and then it uses f prime under the lambda. But it took a while before I even realized we had to do this. So that's yeah, the same thing. Is that is. Kind of by means and automatically sits the left on the front. Yeah, I could have, but I only found this one function where I need it. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. The other thing about that is that you were naming just a single use of the arguments. Yeah. That could be important so you don't get duplication of computation. Um, so this little program, you would think that it should print 42 and it does not Haskell. It wouldn't do that in you because if you desugar it, it's a call to this function greater than greater than and with two arguments and of course it evaluates the arguments first to get an error so well you say by name on that too so there are like 20 places maybe in the code base that says by name there are some other functions like when unless from maybe so it seems to be somewhat natural to have laziness in some of these people would never use Pascal or functional languages they came to me and complained that from maybe was not lazy. Well, they didn't express it that way. From maybe takes a maybe value to, to look at and, and the sort of a default value. So if it's nothing, you'll get the default value. And they could put in calls the error as a default value. And that blew up, of course. So I had to change that. Uh, I'll skip over this. So you really want lazy binding sometimes. Uh, so if you have some really slow computation, then you're going to use that, say, inside a map. You really want to do it zero or one time, not every time. Or not, I mean, not one time, or not every time you apply. So uh, in you, you can put the twiddle in front of a binding and it becomes lazy. And it's even Haskell compatible. Like uh, in GC, you can put the bang to, to make it strict. And the strict data, lazy data structure. There are still things that don't work, like zipping with one dot dot, which in this case doesn't work. Uh, type proxies, which happens now and then. You, need, you really want to make a type application, but Haskell 
you have to pass a value of that particular type. But you don't have a value of that particular type, so you pass undefined of some type, just a combination of type information. That blows up, of course, unless you put the by name on that. The cyclic data structures don't work. And well, I've already talked about this, that this kind of idiomatic way of, of Haskell programming doesn't work. Um, so just some quick final statistics. So I don't really know how many people we have using new. I was guessing at, at 40. Neil, what do you think? Uh, higher. Okay. But not massively higher. So some of these know about functional programming. Ten, maybe. <coughs> A lot of the others are people who don't really, that's not their main business to program. We have about 400,000 lines of new code in about 2,400 modules. So we are very clever by computer science naive users. So I, and they don't write things like test cases that uh, sometimes I mean, if you really twist their arm. So it's good to have strict type checking to at least get some of the bugs out there. <coughs> and, um, so we, we, they are not really supposed to, any, no one's supposed to check in code without having run the type checker over the, the entire code base. And this is my desktop, it takes about 30 seconds to run the type checker, so that's not too bad. So there are not a bit too many complaints about type errors, maybe because they are slightly better than the GHC ones. <laughs> I think the key to it is to give more locations. So here's a type error, and it says the two different types are bool and string. And it tells you where did the bool come from, where did the string come from. And you just so highlight them in red and blue there. And once you have that, you look at them and say, oh, oh yeah, that's wrong. I fix that. Or one plus true. The class which came from the one, that it was the none, and the bool came from true. Oh, yeah, it's wrong. I'll fix that. It also gives you the, this other location that tells you I was here in the type checking when I found this error, which is completely useless. That depends on the order in which you were doing things. These are the interesting ones. Where did the two things come from that didn't work? Why is it reporting one? Is it plus that's getting in trouble? <coughs> well, no, no. no. It's numerical and true isn't. The one well, that's irrelevant. The one also has a none. I mean, the num could come from both plus so and one. True plus and false, what will give us the error? Then it would probably point at plus and false. So, I mean, it's not completely deterministic where it will point, but it will point at two things that are in conflict. And one is certainly a num thing. So, you could say it comes from plus, but it also comes from one. I mean, if I put those two in a list, it, it would give the same kind of errors. Um, we need to have tools for all these kind of naive users. So we have Neil's HLint, which takes Haskell code and gives you sort of hints on how you should rewrite it. So we have a version of that for new with some specific rules added. Um, and it's nicer to get critique from a machine than from people. Uh, there is a read about print thing like GHCI. We also have an IDE, which I think is absolutely crucial for these uh, new beginning users, and it has sort of the usual browsing and editing, and you're compiling the cover over things and see the types, and you have IntelliSense for completing identifiers, and it also has a debugger. People say, oh, we must have a debugger, we must have a debugger, and then that when we finally give them a debugger, they don't seem to be using it. Um, so we try to hide all, everything that has to do with compilation from them. So, sort of like a scripting language. You only have the source code, you point at the source code and say, I want to run this. The fact that this involves all kinds of things and maybe artifacts like executables being produced or something like that. They don't want to know. We don't want them to know. If they need to know that, they might just get things wrong. We don't want them to have make files and things like that. They should have source code and say, I want to run that. I mean, it's running the program that is the interesting thing, not compiling it. I mean, <coughs> I think it's compiling it that's the interesting thing, but that's not difficult. Um, yeah, so that's, that's about it. Right.